So uh, let's start with this lecture 26 is uh, the epilogue. So here, as I said, what we are going to do is uh, wrapping up, uh, talking a little bit about what are the uh, main things that we cover in the course and what should be the main takeaways uh, after having completed this course. Of course, we don't have required readings for this part, but there are some suggested readings for sure, some recommended readings. So recall, what are the major high-level goals of this course? Professor Mudlu already showed you this uh, slide, and this is something that you uh, also have in the, uh, in the website. Uh, this course is about digital design, digital circuits, and computer architecture. It's uh, a very uh, complete course. I'm pretty sure that you cannot find uh, easily something uh, with uh, this you know, uh, this, with this large span of concepts and this uh, depth uh, that uh, Professor Mudlu um, uh, employs to cover all the concepts. Uh, it's a it's, um, very unique course in which the main goals are these three. Understanding what are the basics of uh, uh, the way that computers are built, uh, understand what are the principles of design, and understand what are the precedents. And this understanding is important because thanks to that, you have been able to uh, learn how a modern computer works and real computers work exactly the way that we have explained here. Uh, you, very important thing, uh, having able to evaluate trade-offs in the design and the ideas, that's why uh, whenever we have explained a new paradigm, a processing paradigm, for example, or architecture, architecture paradigm, uh, we have shown pros and cons because we need to evaluate trade-offs trade and we want you to uh, think critically about these designs and about these ideas. One thing that you also did is implementing your own microprocessor, uh, very simple design, but you uh, ended up doing that using uh, your FPGA uh, board in the labs. And uh, in this process, you also learned uh, about how to debug, uh, systematically debug uh, increasingly complex systems, right? So you learn how to debug the designs that you were doing, and thanks to that, you ended up uh, designing this uh, and implementing this simple microprocessor. So those are the main goals, and hopefully you are also, uh, you, you have also been enabled to uh, develop new uh, novel designs. So the focus of, of the course is on basics, principles, precedents, and how to use them to create and implement good designs. And why these goals? Because you are studying computer science, right? So if you are a doctor, maybe you will end up being a specialist of the eyes, but still you need to know that there is a heart, right? And there is a brain, and there are many other components inside our, our body. So uh, even if uh, you are going to end up working in the future in something completely different to computer architecture, you will still be working uh, with, uh, I mean, in the computer science field, right? And uh, all the things that we have covered here and all this knowledge will help you to uh, do many things uh, in a right way and in a nice way in the future. If you do hardware design, you will be able to uh, design better uh, hardware. If you do software design, you will be able to design better software. Why is that? Because now you know how the architecture is built, how the computer is built uh, um, inside. And uh, for example, you will keep in mind that there, is, that there is a cache hierarchy. And in this cache, uh, probably the caches have certain size in L1 and certain size in L2 and so on and you uh, will keep in mind what it's going to be probably stored in the cache when you are uh, running the program that you are uh, coding, that you're writing. So this uh, knowledge is, um, I mean, it's useful uh, in all aspects of computer science. So uh, hopefully also designing better systems, uh, uh, be uh, smart when having to make design decisions and having to uh, analyze trade-offs. Of course, understanding uh, um, why computers be behave the way they do. But the most important things are these three, right? Which actually are like even more general than the course. 
it's an engineering course. It's a computer science course. So one thing is that you have learned or are learning, not only in this course, also in other courses, but here it's something that uh, Professor Mudlu really had in mind when he designed the course. He wanted you to learn how to solve problems better and also think in parallel. What does it mean? I mean, unfortunately, well, our mind is not so uh, multi-threaded or, or, or simd as uh, some of the paradigms that we have covered here. But we are able to uh, take many different things into account when we are doing some analysis, when we are uh, analyzing a system or when we are designing a system. There are different things that we are able and you will have to keep in mind when you are doing that, right? So you will need to think about, uh, you know, the SIMD you need if you're writing SIMD code or how the general, I mean, uh, how an out of order uh, processor works if you are simply writing uh, some sequential code. But as I said before, you will also be have to uh, you will also have to uh, take into account what might be happening or can be happening with the uh, cache hierarchy and so on. So this is what thinking in parallel means and also, of course, thinking crit crit critically, right? So being able to uh, evaluate uh, designs in a critical way. And there was, uh, this was a long way since the beginning of the course. We started with the transistors as building blocks and we ended up talking even uh, uh, about uh, system software mechanisms. Maybe not so much as uh, we would have liked, but uh, still we did. Uh, and uh, in between, we talk about logic design, ISA and microarchitecture, which are the main uh, components of the, or the central components of uh, computer architecture. The key execution paradigms, we call pipelining, out of order execution, CMD, uh, multi threading, et cetera. And, uh, and finally, in the last lectures, the memory system, uh, main memory, caches, and uh, virtual memory. So key takeaways, takeaway one, everything that was covered here is real and it's used in real systems. So this is uh, very important. Second thing, all the principles that we cover applied broadly, even though, you know, we talk about GPUs, for example, right? And GPUs are, let's say, well, are um, um, uh, function uh, specialized ac accelerators, let's say. In the beginning, they were uh, designed only for graphics processing, right? But they are based on some principles that apply much broadly, right? Because you remember that we also have SIMD uh, units in supercomputers like the Cray-1 uh, or Cray-XP that we have in uh, CAB building, or uh, we also have uh, SIMD instructions in general purpose CPUs as the ones as you have uh, in your laptops, for, for example. And uh, third takeaway, again, uh, trade-off analysis and critical thinking, and hopefully this is already clear. This is the uh, entire view of, uh, you know, the transformation hierarchy that uh, it's the central part of this course. Uh, what we have, the narrow view, what we have uh, in, the, in the middle is the uh, hardware software interface, which essentially is the ISA, and the microarchitecture, but the expanded view of computer architecture is much wider, uh, spanning from the device and the logic to the, the algorithm and the programming languages. Uh, so what's the best way to approach this course? You already know this uh, slide, but it's good to, um, to recap, uh, not only to make sure that uh, everything with respect to the course is clear, but also you know, to, to, to give you the right mindset uh, um, for, for the final exam. So take it as a learning and grow experience. Uh, what we cover here uh, changed the world in some way. It changed uh, computing systems. And uh, you know that, I guess you know that computing systems changed the world in the last 20, 30, 50 years. Um, and everything will be more and more important for obvious reasons. And even if you uh, are not a future architect, all the uh, things that we cover here, as I said before, will be important for your future. So focus on main goal here, focusing on the understanding, learning, and critical analysis, because these are the agents of your growth. And the course, Professor Mudlu designed this course with that goal and this, that focus in mind.
Unfortunately, it wasn't possible to cover everything related to computer architecture. Computer architecture has many more topics, which are also uh, very, very interesting. Um, but it, this is something that uh, you, you will still have time to, uh, to um, worry about, uh, because there are many ideas, creativity, trade-offs, and problems to solve, and uh, things like uh, how to make system scale, how to improve performance, improve energy consumption, uh, deal with reliability or security issues, these kind of things are uh, really important when designing uh, computing systems these days. And this is something already obvious in some, let's say, recent trends. So for example, uh, AI and machine learning, we are designing accelerators uh, for these type of applications, and they are uh, extremely important in all the fields where AI and machine learning are being used. You can, for example, search for uh, Tesla cars, and you will see that they have um, uh, especially design uh, and machine learning accelerators to deal with uh, all the uh, workloads that are needed for the um, for self-driving um, there are many hardware security issues that we have to worry about and we uh, have to come up with uh, nice ways to solve them we have row hammer spectre meltdown are things that we have covered here in the course and there are also uh, new execution paradigms like processing in memory or new technologies like memory technologies, for example, like uh, non-volatile memories like PCM or RERAM and many more that are being uh, studied these days. So there are uh, many things to do. Uh, visionary lecture that you might want to watch again, I, I guess that most of you already did, is uh, Professor Mudlu's uh, ETH inaugural lecture. Okay. Um, some takeaways. Uh, it's uh, recall this from lecture two. This is an exciting. It's an exciting time to be understanding and designing computing computing platforms, uh, and there are many uh, challenges, uh, many exciting problems to solve. Why is that? Because the world is changing. There is a lot of data out there, and we uh, we should be able to use this data in the uh, smart uh, the smartest possible way. This is the uh, we are uh, call, uh, so it's, it's said that we are in the uh, era of big data, right? So what should we do with all that data? We should be able to use it to make a stronger and better computing systems. But also we need to create these systems to be able to analyze all this data. And there are challenges and difficulties to solve, uh, like, for example, energy, reliability, complexity, and so on. This is uh, more or less uh, the state of the art. Uh, applications are ever more demanding. There are um, emerging uh, technologies, like, for example, memory te technologies that I just mentioned, many requirements, systems, and security, reliability issues, so many, many things to do uh, in computer architecture. Uh, here you can see a list of some of the ideas and topics that we couldn't cover in this course, but hopefully if you're interested you will uh, keep learning in, in, in uh, later courses that we have. I will talk uh, about them briefly. For example, prefetching or run-ahead execution, emerging memory technologies, SSDs and storage, interconnection networks, and so on, so on, so on, as you can see. And you need to um, understand all of them very well if you want to build uh, efficient computing systems, right? It's the same as um, Calatrava had to do when he designed this building in New York. Uh, he had to know everything about real uh, architecture uh, before uh, daring to design this thing. And even though he did, you remember also that he had to replan, he had to redesign because there were some security issues. So this is something that you will also have to do um, when you design systems, software, hardware in your future career. Okay, as an example of one of the things that we couldn't cover and it's super important in uh, real world systems and it's some, something that you can actually find in every uh, uh, CPU these days is prefetching. But I think that Professor Moodle already mentioned prefetching in the course, right? But let's very briefly uh, talk about uh, prefetching. The idea in prefetching is fetching the data before it's needed. So you know that we have a memory hierarchy, and in this memory hierarchy, we have a very 
large memory, which is, let's say, at the bottom, is the main memory, typically DRAM, and then we have different levels of cache. Uh, ideally, we will always find the data, the, the, the program will always find the data that needs in the L1 cache. Why is that? Because it's the closest one to the core, so it's the fastest, right? So if we are able to make something to uh, put whatever data is going to be needed into this L1, then the performance will be uh, the, the best possible performance, right? Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, this is not always possible. And it's not always possible because sometimes we have uh, unpredicted, uh, unpredictable memory accesses. But in many, many programs, uh, it's something that is possible, is doable, because there are predictive, uh, predictable memory accesses. For example, if you have a, a streaming access pattern, which essentially means that you have to go over an entire uh, array element by element. For example, if you're doing one um, vector addition, you are adding uh, vector A plus vector B element-wise. So if your code is sequential, you will go to element zero, element one, element two, and so on. As you already know, if you go and uh, try to access element zero, and this element zero is not in the cache, you will have to go to main memory, then because you will have a cache miss, and then you bring an entire cache line, which probably will contain four, eight, or 16 of, of the elements. So after having miss in the first memory access, then you will have several hits. But right, af right after that, you will again have a miss, so you will need to go to main memory again. If you analyze this program, you see that the, uh, the access is sequential. So every, uh, every, let's say, eight accesses, you will have a miss, and then seven hits, and then again a miss. And the miss happens because you need to bring, you need to fetch the next cache line. So if you already know that, you can directly go to memory and prefetch this cache line and put it in the cache, in the L1 cache, for example, so that uh, as soon as the um, uh, CPU needs to carry out this memory access, the data will be already in the cache. We will have a cache hit and um, much higher performance, right? It's not always possible, as I said. There are some applications, for example, graph processing, where the accesses are more random, so more, much more difficult to predict. Um, well, there are four questions around prefetching, what to prefetch, when to prefetch, because if, if I prefetch something like very much in advance, it, it might turn out that because it's not being used for some time, it will get replaced, so evicted from the cache. So I also have to write, uh, to, to fetch in the uh, right time and also put the data that I, I, I read in the right uh, place as well. There are different ways of doing this. Hardware prefetchers, there are hardware prefetchers. We will cover this in later courses, but also software prefetching. This is something that uh, you, can, um, uh, you can already find. For example, ISA instructions that are uh, software prefetching in, in Intel CPUs. And many different questions to uh, answer or many uh, different, you know, angles or aspects of prefetching that uh, need to be uh, taken into account. And one example or one, let's say, sort of uh, prefetching is run-ahead execution, which is what Professor Mudlu, uh, one of the things that Professor Mudlu did in his PhD thesis. Um, he had, let's say, a dream when he was uh, starting with his PhD thesis, and his dream was designing the perfect cache, which means that every time that I need to access to memory, instead of having to go to L2, L3, or uh, main memory, I will find the value that I need in L1. So that's the perfect cache, always a hit, you know? So if I have a perfect cache, a perfect cache, I will, uh, the CPU will be doing some computation, executing instructions represented here by this uh, green box, and then uh, we will have a memory access, for example, here one uh, load, certain value that I need from memory, and because the cache is perfect, I find it in, in the cache, so it's a hit, and right after that, we continue with the execution, and then another hit in a different uh, memory load, and then some more um, computation. This is a perfect cache, but unfortunately, it's not what we have in reality. In reality, we might have something like this, 
we will start computing and at some point we uh, need to go to memory because we don't find the data in L1 or L2 or L3, so we have a miss and we need to go to main memory. And this takes some time to be served. Uh, the miss takes uh, quite a bit of time. Maybe in the beginning we still have some independent instructions and we can continue executing them uh, in the um, um, CPU in the course, but at some point we will have to stall and wait until this miss is served. When we get the value from, from memory, then we can uh, continue computing and we will find another miss in the second load. And again, uh, we, we have to stall until the miss uh, is served and we finalize the uh, computation. So as you can see here, most of the time of the CPU is not being productive. The CPU is idle because there are no more instructions to execute. And the rest of instructions are dependent on the, 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 the uh, load instructions here, the load instruction that is missing in the cache here and, and here, this load too. With the run ahead uh, execution, what we can do is doing some kind of a speculative execution in which if we are lucky, hopefully, we can reach to more accesses, miss in the cache and start serving these uh, misses, these memory accesses in parallel. So the, in a way that we can exploit memory level parallelism. And this way we will end up saving a lot of cycles. The idea is something like this. We start the computation and at this point in time we uh, have a load uh, to memory, so a load from memory, we are missing in the cache and again, same as before, we have to go to the main memory, right? But now instead of just simply stalling the pipeline, what we do is entering what is called the run ahead mode. That essentially means that first of all, we save the architectural state. Do you remember what's the architectural state? It's the value of the program counter and the contents of the register file. So if we have these two, we can uh, recover the uh, point of execution whenever we want. So what we do here right before starting the um, run ahead mode is saving the program counter and saving the contents of the register file. And we enter this run ahead mode. Probably some of the instructions that we will execute during this run ahead mode, which essentially means that we keep executing instructions uh, of, the, um, um, of, the, of the program uh, on the pipeline, maybe some of these instructions that will be executed were, will be uh, unproductive in the future. You know why? Because uh, those computations will probably be dependent on this miss that we have here. So probably the result of uh, these computations will be um, useless, let's say. But the good thing is that we will probably reach this second load. And if we reach this second load, what is going to happen is that we have a miss. But observe that now the miss, we found this miss pretty uh, faster with respect to the regular execution on an out-of-order core. So right at this point in time, we also ask the memory to serve this memory access. So as you can see, both memory accesses happen in parallel for some time in a way that when we find again, we, uh, so after, after returning from the uh, first load, we let's say recover, you remember that we had a, ch a checkpointing, uh, a check, um, yeah. Uh, checkpointing. So we go to the checkpoint. We take the value of the uh, of the values of the register file, the value of the uh, program counter, and we continue with the execution. Now this execution is correct, and the good thing is that during this computation, the uh, second miss is finally being served. So when we go again and try to load this um, value, this uh, memory access here, which is the same memory access as here, then uh, we hit in the cache and we can continue the execution. We are saving all this uh, style here, so we end up saving all these cycles. So, was this useful, this research in particular? Yes, it was, and actually, uh, one machine where this uh, run ahead execution was implemented is this uh, Sun Rock. And here you can see some results on a real system for different cache sizes. You can see the normalized IPC 
Um, a scout was the name that uh, Sang gave to this uh, run ahead execution. For the same size uh, of the L2, you can uh, obtain up to 40% better performance. But also a very interesting thing here is that you can get exactly the same performance uh, by uh, having a, a, a much smaller cache. For example, seven megabytes smaller um, uh, in the case of a scout here, or 12 megabytes smaller in this case, if uh, you know the original cache was 16 megabytes. Okay, this is, as I said, just one example of the many things that we still need to cover uh, in computer architecture. Um, this is the paper, the original paper about the run ahead execution. This is a shorter one that was public, uh, pu uh, published in uh, micro topics. And here are some more uh, recommended uh, readings. So if you want more of this exciting thing that is computer architecture, you have future options. Like for example, taking the bachelor seminar, uh, taking the, in the future, the computer architecture uh, master's course, read all the papers that were recommended here in the course, and uh, analyze them, discuss them with us if you want. You can, if we, uh, you can reach any of us and send us an email and tell us, I want to discuss this paper with you, or there is something here that uh, I don't understand very well. You are welcome to do that. And uh, of course, you are invited to do research with us if you are uh, interested. This is the beautiful logo of our group. And this is our motto. Think big, aim high, essentially be ambitious, and try to do always the best that you can do. Uh, again, the bachelor uh, seminar, this one will, I mean, we have this seminar every semester, fall and spring semester. The next one, obviously, will be the uh, fall semester. And here, what we do is um, uh, reading papers and analyzing them. In the very beginning of the course, of the seminar, we will offer some papers that uh, we select because we consider that they are uh, very important and useful in computer architecture. Uh, some of the papers are historical, let's say. Some of uh, other papers are very, very recent. And what you do is select your favorite paper, read it, and analyze critically. And after that, having discussion with two of us, two members of the group, uh, which, let's say, uh, act as your mentors. They help you to understand the paper. They help you to prepare a very nice presentation. And someday you go there, and in front of everyone, you give your talk. Why is this useful? Not only because you learn a lot of uh, things about computer architecture from your own paper, from other people's presentations, but also because you will develop your skills for analyzing and uh, synthesizing information, but also your presentation skill, which is something that I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that will be useful for you. You can even watch uh, the video because we record uh, the, the videos, you know, for grading, for internal use, and if you want to have access to them, uh, they can also be uh, um, very useful to uh, watch yourself and, and learn uh, about your own experience. And then we have the uh, computer architecture course where we cover, uh, I mean, we, you know, uh, review many of the things that were already covered here in this course, but uh, we, we also go uh, far beyond. And if you are interested in doing research with us, which is something super nice, super fun, you, first of all, is uh, email Professor Mudlu and CC uh, me and uh, Mohammed, Lois, and Hassan. Uh, of course, we encourage you to take the, um, these two courses uh, that I just mentioned and do all the readings and assignments uh, on your own. There are many, many exciting projects here uh, in memory systems, in hardware security, uh, in accelerators like FPGAs, uh, uh, GPUs, uh, the Reunion systems in general, new execution paradigms, for example, like processing in memory. Several of us are working on, on that these days. And interaction between security, architecture, reliability, energy, performance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, also uh, architectures for uh, particular fields, like for example, genomics and, and medical and, and, and health. Okay, any questions so far? No? Okay, I have uh, two quotes for you to think about. 
The first one is this one, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. So therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man, which is the one who tries to change the world. This is a quote from uh, George uh, Bernard Shaw. He was an Irish uh, playwriter, famous for several of his, uh, um, uh, of, his, of his plays, like for example, uh, Pygmalion. This is the guy, very serious. And here you have also a very, the, the second quote also from him, uh, very nice and, and interesting uh, to think about. Progress is impossible without change, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything, right? Sounds good. So keep that in mind, uh, not only for, uh, you know, these exams that are coming now, but also for the next uh, courses that you will take uh, here during the, your uh, bachelor's degree and, and for sure uh, in your future uh, uh, career when you're in the job market. This is all for now.